I would like now to start the panel discussion. Um, I think we will ponder over your last question, but I knew there were some questions from the back um, following Daphne's presentation, and maybe I can invite those uh, first, if you're right with that. So there's a question from the um, online uh, listeners, and we will proceed with that and then follow on with your questions at the back. Thank you. Um, I actually have four questions. Sorry. Four questions. Okay. Um, two of them are short ones, Fran, and then two are for the panel, if that's all right. Okay. Um, so my first question, Fran, is from Medicine, who are asking, is HPV vaccination too controversial in countries where sexual promiscuity is abhorred and preventative measures disdained? So the, the idea with HPV vaccination is you should give it before you have a sexual intercourse. So the target is young women, like 11 years mm -hmm. old. And that's the difficulty with the EPI, that that you need to get them after the normal EPI program. Um, but there's also some effect of giving it after you have sexual debut, because you might be infected with one HPV type, but not all of them. And uh, they're covering several different HPV types. Thank yeah, you. so maybe to add to that, I don't think that in the world of HP vaccination, and there are many um, promoting this at the moment, there is a condition on being vaccinated that you must stick only with one sexual partner following your vaccination. Yeah. Could Thank be difficult you. to monitor as well. Um, sorry, my second answer is from Dr. Sanko, who's asking, um, what did you do for the 4% of women with an outcome of cervical cancer once confirmed, and are there services in place to provide further management? Um, so in the country, we have, uh, there is a further service, but it's quite expensive. So you can get a hysterectomy, you can get everything, but it costs several hundreds of dollars. So most patients can't afford that. And we did a small follow-up on the not on the patients with confirmed cancer, but, but the one with clinical suspicion of cancer. And it was one had died, one was waiting for hysterectomy, and the rest had not done anything else. Um, so that's, that's a problem among our cohort, mm -hmm. which is a very poor cohort. I think there is a great need for better availability of cancer treatment across many developing countries, including radiotherapy and palliative care. Thank you. Um, so my third question for the panel um, is from Dr. Sikidis from The Lancet, who's asking, um, or commenting as well, um, what I've heard so far this morning makes me wonder, are we being too cautious about assessing treatments in children and pregnant women? I think that is a bit of a general question. So the question is, are we being too, too cautious, cautious about assessing treatments in children and pregnant women? About assessing treatment. In, um, in relation with the um, oral cholera vaccine, mm, I think that's I what think so. Might so are we being too cautious when it comes to young children uh, regarding consent and pregnancy and pregnant women? Uh, would you care to maybe give a comment on that? Um, I think, yeah, there, there is something where we, we, we could be very cautious when there is a pregnant woman and, and babies in, in the game. Um, for example, in cholera vaccine, where there is no real uh, reason why we should ex exclude them from the vaccination, but uh, there is no very uh, important safety data that really ensure everybody that there will no whatever occurs be uh, it is not so sure to vaccinate them, then we won't do it. And I, I think we as, uh, as MSF, maybe we, we, we could have like a, a back step to, to see um, what is really the benefit and the risk on vaccinated those pregnant women. And in, in the case of cholera, oral cholera vaccine, this is clear that we, we should include them okay. without an adopt. I think Maybe. this would be quite a big debate that lots of people will have points of view on. It's not fair to ask you to answer the question. We'll bear it in mind. Can we have the last online question? Um, and then this I is feel another I big one as well. Um, so it's from Trish um, Schwertel in Australia who's asking, um, how do researchers become involved in projects if we're increasingly concerned with accountability? Does evaluation need central coordination? That's also a very broad question. <laughs> so the first part is should. Um, how do we become involved in research if we're increasingly concerned with accountability? Okay. I guess the big question is, does evaluation need central coordination? So I think this is about research ethics and good research conduct. And I, I think, think this we're came going from the last presentation. From the last presentation. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask each of the four presenters to say something in response to that. Bear in mind that's not the definitive 
response, because this is obviously a very um, important, far-ranging question. Would, would we like to start with Timothy, maybe? I think uh, field research is critically important. Asking questions uh, in the clinical setting, um, it, it's part of, I think, MSF's mandate. Okay. Yeah. As for us, we didn't need an ethical review because we only did analysis of our routinely collected data. But I think it's always important to comment on if you do it and if you don't do it and for what reason. Yeah, I mentioned as we talked a lot about innovation, and in MSF we tend to try to innovate and in, in, in medical um, uh, point of view. Then, yeah, we have like the duty to, to make some ethical research attached to this innovation to monitor and evaluate uh, our actions. Um, I think that was somehow the point that we wanted to show with this study as well, that we, we thought of having, as, it was because we like standardization, uh, because it makes things graspable and easy, and that we wanted to show with th this studies that if we try to standardize too much, then uh, it leaves gaps, and that, um, so for that reason, that it's of huge importance to, to go into detail and look into your, your data and uh, see how for, at, at soon for operational uh, perspective, that you can, you can adapt your, your strategy strategies and your management so you can you can provide better care, you can do better. So yes, I think. Thank you very much. I would now like to open to the floor again. There are two burning questions up about the lady in the white top who might go first. Yeah. Could we give the lady with the white uh, top a microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Could I start off with a comment on one of the earlier questions? Could you actually? say where you're from and your name, maybe? Oh, sorry. I'm Jane Cooper. I'm a student at the LSE at the moment. Um, I think there are a few things more controversial than labeling other people's sexual behavior as promiscuous. Um, I think that links into all the other topics we're discussing, because um, if we haven't thought through our attitudes to sex, then we are at risk of neglecting topics which have an impact on women's health. So I think it's important that we do talk about sex, but let's try not to be judgmental, please. Um, then if I could turn to some questions on the presentations. Could you take one question at a time? What you is your first question, please? Uh, my first question is in relation to the last presentation on context-specific or standardized package. Um, do you think there would be merit in soliciting feedback or undertaking, undertaking qualitative research to solicit the views of clinic attendees, communities, and local counselors? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for that question because I think it, it draws up something very important that um, it's, um, this is all qualitative analysis and we need to do more qua um, qualitative ones, sorry. And I, it's, it must be very important to look into um, not a, one part the satisfaction of the, of the care that uh, the survivors received, but also to understand better um, their barriers to come, why did they come, come in late, uh, why is there refusal of different treatments. We understand sometimes that it's a lot about <clears throat> how, you, how you present it as well, like in another project, we, we try to offer uh, contraceptives as well, and then the, the care providers were like, but we can't offer contraceptives to, to women who just have been raped, how do you come onto that? And we say, yes, if you look at it from, from a broader perspective, it might be needed, so I think it's absolutely a component that needs to be, um, that needs to be added, that will enrich um, the studies that we are having now. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to the gentleman behind you. I will remember you have more questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, um, Gabriel Fitzpatrick's my name, MSF Ireland. I only have one question, um, and it, it's regarding the last um, speaker. We know in we know there's circumstantial evidence that sexual violence and rape is a big issue in institutions such as prisons and psychiatric institutions in countries where MSF works. Um, so my question is. For those centres that were in your study, were, were, there, were any of those patients coming from those uh, institute, institutionalised settings where you know, you've marginalised people, or were any of those um, uh, centres doing any outreach work into, um, say, prisons or psychiatric centres? Um, 
as far as I know, on, on the different profiles of the, of the survivors included in this and on the settings that we were working, um, no, and not a, definitely not as a focus of, uh, of these settings. Um, we know as well that, for instance, in schools, uh, a lot might happen. So we've, uh, when, when you see a lot of child survivors, it's also something to question and to investigate further in. Um, but uh, in, in other projects uh, that are running for the moment, um, for instance, working with my Migrants. There we know that um, a lot of the survivors coming from there, uh, the moment uh, where, the, um, where the violence happened was uh, while being, uh, for instance, in prison or, or such institutions, as you mentioned. Um, but not from the, from, the, um, from the study settings that I was presenting here, or not an, in, a, in an important number. Okay. Uh, this gentleman at the back, go ahead. Um, would you pass him the microphone, please? Thank you. Hi, Sid Wong, Medical Director for OCA. Um, my question is also towards Daphne and, and sexual violence. Um, it's a broader question and it's actually an operational question. Um, I think across our portfolios, it, it's fair to say that we have introduced a sexual violence intervention in a number of our countries, but yet a lot of our patient numbers come from very few countries, um, namely DRC. So one of the challenges that we face is actually how do you prioritize sexual violence activities within quite an integrated program that is looking at numerous health needs? And then my second point point is, the lessons learned from places like DRC, how do you then put, adapt that to contexts like South Sudan, where actually we just do not see the, the numbers of sexual violence survivors that, that, that we know that exist? Okay, thank you for that. Can I just ask if there's anyone else who has a question pertaining to this at this moment? So we bundle them and then move to another topic, maybe? Yes, would you care to ask your question? And Daphne, uh, would you then answer? Try to. I'm Charles Sonko from MSF uh, UK. My question is about, um, there was a difference, clear difference between the two settings in terms of the victims of violence. Uh, my question is, are there possible reasons for the differences in PEP coverage? Because in DLC it was 100%, but in Monrovia it was Mm -hmm. Around 80 percent. Okay. Okay. Um, so, trying to respond to these three questions, um, one was on uh, how to prioritize or to look into which uh, context uh, to implement or to in integrate. Um, these packages of care. Um, well, actually, as a general recommendation from our working group on reproductive health and sexual violence, we'd like to say, please be ready in any project in MSF to give at least a minimum package of care to survivors of sexual violence. Um, so that's the general recommendation, but we know that there are competing priorities. Um, and that for this reason, we also tried to make it um, more simple. We know it's not a simple topic, um, but that the minimum that we should be ready is that once someone comes to our services that we can give them the, the correct treatments and, and a minimum of emotional support. So we try to make it uh, less heavy. And then at the same time, um, it is very interesting to look at operational portfolios where uh, vertical programs can be set up because we do know that um, when also enough attention is put onto the topic, um, that we do see uh, the victims coming to our services. Um, so perhaps that gives a little bit of a response to that first one. Um, and then for in looking into contexts as South Sudan, but there are, there are many other contexts uh, where it is challenging to bring up the topic. Um, and also from there, we, we learned a couple of um, we, we learned a couple of lessons, and one is actually that we need to start talking about it, and we cannot expect actually that the survivors start talking about it and come to our service and knock on our door and say, why don't you provide this service? So it's actually something up to us care providers to say, um, let's open the discussion, and it starts just with your, with your medical teams and with all the other teams you have in your projects and uh, with uh, focus group discussions and so on to, to open the topic, and then you will see uh, more frequently than 
than, than not, that uh, it's not always such a hard topic to talk about. And once you can start talking about it, um, it can be much easier as well to, to start implementing it and, and to, to offer this kind of, of, of care. It's, uh, and so I would really like to invite everyone on the field to, to start to taking the first step and not to wait for the first step to come for the from the survivors, as it's very difficult. Um, and then there was the question on the coverage of PEP initiation in Monrovia. Um, I have to be honest, I don't know why it was lower. Um, I'm not sure if that could be drawn out of the... Um, of the analysis that we were able to do. We had the, the rough data, well, not the rough data, we had uh, patient individual databases where we can see what is the coverage, uh, but um, I'm no, sorry for that one. I, I don't know in Liberia why it was lower than in DRC. Thank you very much, Daphne, for that marathon run. <laughs> uh, I know there are quite a few questions around the cholera vaccination among pregnant women, and I'd like to open the floor a little bit for people who have still remaining questions around that. Uh, does that include you, sir, in the yellow shirt? Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hugo Smith from Amsterdam, Holland and also from the University Medical Center in Utrecht. I have a uh, question for uh, Lisa. Uh, nice study about the side effects of uh, vaccine, but I wasn't quite clear about your design. Um, uh, you were looking at uh, women who were pregnant, but how did you knew, know that they were pregnant? And isn't it possible that uh, you missed a, a large group of pregnant women, especially the women in the first trimester of the pregnancy? And what? Which could you say about uh, what, what, what effect would this have on the results? If Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, actually, that's why one of the limitations of a retrospective cohort is that you come after uh, the battle. So basically, we entered in all the households and we asked if one of the women in the household has been pregnant, whether the, the children is alive or not, has been pregnant in 2012. And if the response was yes, the answer was yes, then we, we asked for the booklet of, of the children if there were any visits in an antenatal care. But yes, one of the two, two responses of your question, the first is that in our definition of a pregnancy loss is a loss after the woman recognizes she's pregnant, and that's the first one, because most of the of the miscarriage occurred, and the woman didn't know she was pregnant, and she didn't notice she she's losing a, a fetus. So we we couldn't uh, at all uh, include this kind of loss, and it it would be very difficult to do that even in a prospective study because you would have to test every woman in, in, in age of, uh, of being uh, pregnant to see if maybe she's pregnant. So this is a, a tough part. But then we all say it was very declarative. And actually, more than 80% of the women had a booklet for their children. But if the children was alive, then for the woman who lost the, the fetus, it was not the case, because the, the, the fetus never was never born. So this is why a prospective study would be really useful, because then when you vaccinate a woman who is pregnant, you can follow her. And uh, one of the questions was, do we miss more losses for women that were vaccinated because they were afraid of saying, yes, I was vaccinated and I lost the, the, the baby? Or do we miss more uh, losses for unvaccinated that were ashamed of not getting the vaccine and then losing the baby? That's a question we have, and that's all the tricky part of a respective mm -hmm. cohort. Thanks, Liz. Thank you very much for that, that answer. It's very complicated to do these studies, and I think your point was also that if you're talking about congenital abnormalities, if they exist, they're most likely to be lost very early mm -hmm. on in the pregnancy. So that is uh, an important study, but important limitations. There are two questions here about uh, cholera vaccination, which we will take and then move on. We are running out of time, so can we have short questions Answers. and short answers? Yeah. Go ahead, sir. You were first, I think. Um, sorry, Nick. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Paul Bonsha. I'm from BBC Media Action. Um, so my question really is that um, in the cholera vaccination um, survey, did you collect any data on maternal mortality? Did you ask perhaps using the sisterhood method um, to assess whether or not there were differential rates in mortality by vaccination? Can you do it again? 
So um, did, you ask about, <laughs> did you ask about maternal mortality? And did you write, use the sisterhood method, which might not be appropriate, to be perfectly honest, in this setting? Mm. Do you want to give a quick answer? Look, it's very quick. It's no. We just looked at the effect on the fetus, so uh, pregnancy loss and malformation, but we didn't uh, look at the maternal mortality. And I'm happy to debate the sisterhood method with you in the break. <laughs> <laughs> Philip de Croo, MSF. Um, Lisa, um, so fantastic study, congratulations, very important findings. Um, I wanted to take this to the policy level because I noticed with your study and also Zanzibar, quite wide confidence intervals. Mm. What have we learned because you recommended prospective studies next? Are they going to happen? And if not, what do we need? How much evidence do we need to make a policy recommendation on this in pregnancy? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> and I would love to say, yeah, that will occur, but maybe then I could give, because well, I, I left, unfortunately, I left episode m and and then maybe I can give the floor to peop some people that are really involved in, in MSF to, to know if they are thinking about vaccinated and, and giving a chance to a prospective study to occur. OK. Thank you very much. Can we have a lunchtime debate about that? Wait. I think I'm allowed, um, I'm allowed one question for Tim and one uh, for Anne. If there is anyone who has a question for either Anne or Tim, they may now take the floor. Is that you in the middle with a scarf all around? Thank you very much. And then I'm afraid we will have to end the discussion. I'm getting severe warnings from this side of the panel. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, a question for Tim. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really, really good outcomes. And um, I was wondering about the treatment outcomes of the pregnant women, and also the, what did you do with the anemia um, in, in terms of management? Thank you. I'm Nines, MSF Spain. Uh, the treatment outcomes of the pregnant women were excellent. Um, and uh, also a note, uh, there was uh, no mortality in the maternity group, which was uh, fairly significant to us. Uh, the anemia is, uh, we, we do uh, targeted therapy in terms of uh, ferrous and folate, but uh, what is limited is the ability to transfuse. You know, it's a donor-based society, a family donor, and uh, this is a real uh, stumbling block in this uh, area. It's uh, one of the things that uh, Clearly, one is one of the immediate recommendations to try to expand into some form of blood bank. Thank you for that. And is there, by any chance, a question for Anne? So if not, I do have one. Go ahead, yes. Um, Anne, I just wanted to ask kind of your opinion, really. In terms of really scaling this up, particularly when I'm thinking about rural, decentralized cervical cancer screening, where you've got multiple clinics, um, in terms of human resource, I just really, really challenge to see how we take this forward. And my question is, is there a role, okay, HP vaccination definitely, you know, countries are going for it. Is there a role at all for H using HPV as the first screening test? Um, potentially self-swabbing, ro we're rolling out viral load machines, gene expert machines um, for other things. Do you think there's a role for MSF to look at HPV as the first screening test, and also potentially that will allow us to screen them less frequently, therefore reduce workload. Thank you for the question. At New Lens Clinic, the one that I was talking about, they do that now as a study to see how it's working. Um, I've also seen other studies where they say they have more, like you can more target down the ones that actually have lesions by combining the HPV uh, test with the screening. So uh, I think we, I haven't seen the outcomes of the study from New Lens, but I think definitely it's worth uh, following. Thank you very much, brave panel, to face this audience. And, uh, a bit <laughs> round of applause. Uh, so, thank you, especially Ninka and, and all the um, speakers. It's been an excellent session. We're running a little bit late because your bad MC was thinking of questions instead of doing his job. Um, <clears throat> A big hello to those in Ukraine, Laos, Pakistan, Korea, Vietnam, Peru, and other countries, um, and the Americas who are just joining us. Can I remind the speakers and the <laughs> chair for the next session, um, as well as Janine Lunen, to come to the front for a briefing just before we go to lunch? We've got a 45-minute lunch break, so to be back here. Sorry, an hour and 15, I tell a lie. An hour and 15, I can't add up. 
Um, for, and that's an important reminder because it's not just lunch, it's a chance for discussions and it's a chance to look at the posters. There is um, an online poster competition and you should have voting forms if you want to participate from here. Um, if you voted online, please don't vote through the paper system again. <laughs> this year we do have a poster prize. The prize is £1,000, so it's quite significant. And that prize is to go to the group to help participate and do further research in, in the future. Um, we will be streaming MSF uh, Scientific Day from India. Our colleagues will start the, the Lashmaniasis session uh, at 12.20, so in exactly three minutes. If you're not watching, please go outside. Um, and don't have your conversations in here so that people can watch. And if you want to ask questions, um, Carmen, if you can put up your hand, one of our volunteers will happily tweet your questions so that they get asked in the India room. Um, and also just to remember that you can't bring your lunch back in here. So if you do want to watch, but you're also hungry, make sure that you plan how you're going to get that done. <laughs> I think that's everything. Enjoy lunch.